Good evening, everybody. Let's stand to our feet. Spend some time in worship tonight. Just ready ourselves for whatever the Lord would do. Jesus, we want to lift you up in this place tonight. And I cry out for your hand of mercy to heal me. I need, I need your love to free me. Oh, Lord, my rock, you're my strength. Get to your people and we worship you tonight, Lord. And I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like. Well, 
I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night when you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father.
We are in Romans chapter 10 tonight. Uh, Nick is uh, down in uh, Sarasota. His grandmother is not doing well. We want to keep him in prayer. Uh, We've just had actually quite a few prayer requests this uh, week and just want to keep your 
keep your church family in prayer and especially just lift up. I don't, I'm not sure whose prayers I'm at liberty to repeat, but uh, I know there's quite a good many people that are looking for a touch from the Holy Spirit, and uh, we want to be we want to be faithful in just lifting up our brothers and sisters before the Lord. Romans 10 is um, Romans 10 is a very interesting chapter because. Uh, and we alluded to this, uh, 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 I think it was last week when we talked about Paul's uh, willingness to be cut off from Christ and to be accursed for the sake of the Jews. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is really the parallel. One of the things that we need to remember whenever you're studying an Old Testament passage is there's always a New Testament application. Old Testament passages are, are there to prefigure the covenant that God was going to make with his church. So a lot of people kind of like, well, I'm not, I'm not in the Old Testament. I'm not under the law. Why do I need to study it? It will help you, believe me, to more deeply understand the covenant that you have with Jesus Christ. And so Paul is alluding to that tonight. Let me, let me just kind of jump into Romans 10. Let's just get, get the, I want to go through the first 13 verses right now, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Paul says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. You remember you go back to Romans chapter 7 and Paul's talking about, I have the desire to do good, but I can't do it. Now he's, he's speaking of the, the, the nation of Israel. They, have, they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, several years ago, uh, actually a good number of years ago, probably a couple decades ago now, um, my uh, father's sister was dying of cancer. And it was terminal. And I had not spoken to her for many years, probably since my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary, which was many years before that, or a good number of years before that anyway. And the Lord just impressed, my, just impressed upon me to give her a phone call. And I shared that verse with her in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Now, if you've been here any length of time, you've heard me tell the Niagara Falls story where uh, who hasn't heard that one? Okay, you haven't heard that story. Okay, so most of you have. Um, it, my pastor told me this, and, and when I was actually a youth director, we were doing a youth event in Niagara Falls, and he was, he was telling me about a side street right off the falls where they have a, kind of a mannequin, and there's a, a tightrope strung between two buildings across the street, and the mannequin goes back and forth on a, I think it's a unicycle or something like that. Well, the real story of that was a gentleman who uh, used to push people in a, a wheelbarrow across the falls. I mean, imagine that now you do, you do that, you get arrested. But he used to do this since probably turn of the 20th century, the early 1900s, and and so he would push his, his assistant back and forth a couple of times across the fall. Of course, a big crowd would gather, and he would say, who believes I can do that again? Well, they're all excited. They want to see him do it again. Yes, we believe. I believe you can do it again. And he would say, then you, sir, get in. <laughs> see, if you really believe, it would, I mean, if you actually knew, that's why we get on roller coasters, right? I mean, if we thought there was a 50% chance it would fly off the rails, we wouldn't get on it. But when you believe that there's a 100% chance you're going to get off this thing, you just are going to enjoy the ride. It's going to be fun. If I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I could get in that wheelbarrow and there was no way anything bad could happen to me, then I would want that experience. Faith is like that. Faith is not, and that's what Paul's saying, faith is not intellectual belief. And when he says it's not based on knowledge, 
He's not talking about an intellectual belief. He's talking about knowing something that, where there's a, an intimacy to that. And so when we talk about, and I don't, I don't, uh, I think the clicker's up here. I'm not, <laughs> I'm going to have to guess. We, we had carpet installed this week, and, uh, and so we're, we're kind of scrambling to find where everything is. Um, yeah, there we go. I'm, I, I was think Connor was helping me out. Connor's about, what, 6'4", 275. He can just, you know, look over and he'd actually probably reach over and palm the drums if he wanted to, but... Um, but Paul is talking here about the difference between law versus faith. He's talking about how when in, with, the, with the law, the law rests on man's ability to keep it. And so our fallenness causes, causes a bunch of problems with respect to the law. Number one, we retain a desire for God that Paul talked about in uh, chapter 7. But that zeal is no longer based on an intimate relationship with him. Right. So... If somebody came up to you and like they were married for 25 years and they still had a passionate love for their, for their spouse, uh, that would be impressive. That would be something that you would, you would say that's admirable. If somebody came up and they're just like this super geeky fan, right, like a, you know, of some celebrity, um, and they say, well, I've been this crazy for this person for 20 years, but you don't know the person. Right? So, so your, your understanding of them is based on what they present to you, but it's not really based on any kind of relationship. And so Paul is, Paul is likening that to an intimate knowledge. If you, you go back to like the King James when it talks about, you know, so-and-so knew his wife and they begat a child. It's, the same, it's that same idea of, of actual intimacy and relationship. And Paul is saying that the, the Jews, they had the law, they had facts, but they didn't have that intimate relationship. And so law is dependent, dependent on man. And, and, and we end up, because of that, subject to pride. The sinful belief that we can operate apart from the, the sovereignty of God. I, I've got it covered. I can do this. I can, I can live a righteous life. I can live a holy life. And, and usually when that happens, God will let you really you know, face plant. And, and sometimes it's, it's you know, I, I see these stories and we've talked about these stories of scandals and things like that in the ministry. And they're terrible, but much better that than the person never deal with who he or she really is and stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in that condition. Um, the Brownsville revival that started in 1995, many pastors went there and got saved. Many pastors got saved because they had been operating under religion. And they go to this revival and the spirit of God is moving powerfully and people are being convicted. I mean, there were lines out the door and they would cut off the line and people would just wait, sometimes hours for the next service. I'll just, I'll just stand in line and wait. That they were that hungry for God. And so imagine you're a pastor that's you know, just really into religion and ritual and that's all you've ever known. And suddenly you're confronted with this powerful move of the Spirit that is drawing people to repentance. And you realize, I don't have, I have, I have a zeal for God, but it's not based on knowledge. It's, I, don't, I don't have that intimate understanding of who God is. The laws we've talked about um, is, is, must be perfectly kept. And we've talked about how if you, if you say, well, hey... Uh, Your Honor, I keep, you know, I've kept 347,000 of, of the laws. I only broke one, which was, that, you know, you can't murder. Uh, the judge is still going to throw you in prison. And so you, you can't appeal to all the laws you did keep if you're guilty of, of breaking one. And so faith comes on the scene and operates very differently. And that's why Jesus said he was the scandalon. It's where we get the word scandal. It's we, we translate that, those stumbling block. It's something that is, you know, when, when you think of something that's scandalous, what we, when, we, when we look at that word and you say, well, this is scandalous, what are we meaning? It's we, we immediately want to kind of push it away. We don't want anything to do with that. It's scandalous behavior. And Jesus was talking about himself in that way because it's very, very difficult for human beings to receive that. Faith, when we, when we are moved upon by God, we are moved upon to confess our sin. Nobody can be saved apart from that confession 
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised, from, raised him from the dead, look at, look at all the implications to that statement. Why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to rise? Had a woman tell me, oh, probably a year, year and a half ago, that repentance was unnecessary because repentance is a work. And I thought, that's just about the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Jesus said straight out, unless you repent, you will perish. His first preaching word was repent. And that's what he, he, he led with, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Turn around, stop your behavior. And so when we confess the Lord Jesus, we're not simply just confessing his existence. I saw an article last week, Richard Dawkins, maybe the most well-known atheist in the world, he said, I'm a cultural Christian. And I thought the, the, the disconnect in your logic is, is stark. Because what he was saying is he recognized the moral superiority of the Christian ethos over, say, Islamic. So he's seeing the influence of Islam, is, Islam in, in England. And he's saying, I don't want that. It's an inferior... And, and even somebody like Bill Maher, who made the movie Religi Religulous, I think it's pronounced, making fun of religious people, says the same thing. And I'm like, if this is so patently, obviously, morally superior. Why do you think it is? Because this was something that was very puzzling to, to the peoples when Moses came out of the... Here, here you have a people group that has been 400 years in a pagan land. And they go into the desert, and four decades later, they come out with the highest moral code humanity had ever seen. And so there's something that happened, something that came on the scene. So now you're saying the next covenant, which is Jesus Christ, the last covenant, by the way, that God will make with, with, with humanity, Jesus Christ comes on the scene and is a higher moral code than that. I, I know people that are atheists and that make fun of Christians who say, yeah, but I love the teachings of Jesus. They, they just, they don't want to cross that line into surrender. They don't want to cross, I can, I can keep Jesus at a, at a distance, the scandal on. I can keep him at a distance. I don't, I don't want to accept him in my life. I don't want to make him because I'm going to look like a fool if I suddenly come out tomorrow and say, uh, I shared some months ago, true story about a buddy of mine who uh, owns a, a records, uh, recording studio in Boston, just outside of Boston. And he was chatting one night with Steve Tyler from Aerosmith and he began to witness to him. And Steve Tyler says, you know, I've really thought about that, but I know the first thing God would ask me for. <laughs> and, so, and, and that's the thing, is, is that most people, and, and, and we go back to Romans chapter 1, and, and Paul says, we are without excuse. We're without excuse. We can recognize, we have the intellectual capacity to recognize the moral superiority of, of the teachings of Jesus Christ. We have the intellectual capacity. I, I challenged somebody this week that was an atheist, and they said, you know, uh, I don't need a deity. I just, I just want to live my life with compassion and love for others. And I said, why? Why would you do that? That's, that's crazy. If there is no God, and we are all just a product of Darwinian, Darwinian evolution, we are living in a decaying world where we only have X amount of time, and the time in front of us is worse than the time behind us for most of us in terms of our physical abilities, our mental capacity. Why in the world would you want to be compassionate? Why in the world would you want to do good to other people? There's absolutely no reason. Survival of the fittest. Why, would you, why wouldn't we just want to cull the herd? Why would, I was watching, uh, we were talking last week about the miniseries Centennial. And there's a, there's a scene in it where... Uh, one of the warriors goes out, and this was true, this happened regularly. He goes out, he's an old man, and he wants to die in battle. He, goes, he gets himself killed in battle. And his wife goes off to the edge of the camp to just expose herself because she's now a burden. He had no sons. She's a burden to the tribe. And so why would you waste resources on an old person? Why would you? Well, I had a friend who was an atheist, and I, I challenged him. He said, well, I go out and I do good. And I'm like, why? Why would we want to help people that are mentally disabled? Why would we want to help elderly people? Why would we want to do these things? Because they only make the species weaker. Lions don't do that. They, you know, so, so 
the difference is, and Jesus said this would happen, we would be salt and light. You've been influenced by Christianity. You recognize that it is better to care for the weak. We recognize intellectually, morally, even if you're an atheist. It's better to be compassionate. But take God out of the picture, and it's not. There's no God. Paul said, if there's no resurrection, be the most selfish person. We're, we're the, we'd be the most miserable people on earth if there's no resurrection. He said, eat and drink. In other words, just enjoy, at, you know, keep, it, keep out of jail, but enjoy yourself all you want because tomorrow you may die. So why would you want to be compassionate towards others? Why would you want to share? There's no God. There's no judgment. This is it. This is all you get. And so Paul even says, if that's the case, eat and drink. Enjoy the day. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You may die. And so why would you want to, why would you want to live selflessly? But then he says, but there is. Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And that's the game changer. And a lot of people don't want to deal with that. I had a boss like that. He was an agnostic. And we, I was saved at the time uh, when I was working for him. And he was, a, he was an educated man. He'd gone to Fordham University, and, and he was a thinker, and he liked to read. And, and we talked about, you know, my, my coming to Jesus and everything. And he was, you know, he was respectful at least. But he said something interesting, and I, di- I didn't forget this as a young man. He looked at me and said, you know, Dave, it all comes down to the resurrection. If that's true, then everything else follows. And, I, and, and it really stuck in my head because when somebody would have an argument, well, you know, how did... You know, how did, what did Noah do with the woodpeckers, right? <laughs> so those, those kind of arguments about, uh, you know, how, how did you cram all these animals? How did you get the last weasel on the ark and all these kind of things? And, you know, where did, where did Adam and Eve get spouses for their kids and all those kind of things? Um, sometimes we can get so hung up on that, and it always brought me back to, there's things I'll never know, but if the resurrection is true, and Jesus himself said scripture can't be broken, Maybe I can misunderstand scripture. Maybe I can misinterpret it. I want to be humble enough to say, and and not so dogmatic to say, everything I believe, you know, at age 34, that is what's true and and never be teachable. But at the same time, if Jesus said that this is the case and Jesus rose from the dead, then everything that he did points me to what I need to become. All right, so what Paul is now talking about is the activation of faith. Going beyond the intellectual aspect and into get in the wheelbarrow, so to speak. He begins by talking about confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, This is, again, not simply an intellectual assent to Jesus' position. It's not an intellectual assent to Jesus' resurrection. James puts it this way. You believe there's one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Uh, if if, If you were... Trying to, trying to make this kind of in the v- vernacular of what the Greek, how, how it actually feels in the English. You believe that there's one God? Big deal. You know, uh, some translate it, you do well. It, but, but the idea is, that's, that's a really low bar. That's a really low bar. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. So what James is saying, it's a really low bar to say, well, I believe in God. Big deal. Big deal. Even the demons believe that, and at least they shudder at the mention of his name. You're actually doing worse than a demon, James is saying, if that's all you have. And so what, what Paul is calling us to is a public declaration of the lordship of Jesus. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart. Now what this is meaning is in the, the, the central part of your being. When you, talk, when you look at how the Jew understood the heart, in Hebrew is labath. But when you looked at that, it meant the central part, the essence of who you were. And the Greek word here is, is homologeo, and it means to declare openly, to speak freely. So it's not talking about if you do this once, like if you come down to an altar call and confess... It means more like if you are confessing, it's a regular thing. It's an ongoing thing. The tense in the Greek is ongoing thing. If you confess. And what, what that's saying is if our lives, if our words regularly are confessing Jesus Christ, if we believe in the central part of our being that God has raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. So, so the Bible is speaking of this ongoing declaration. Uh, he's speaking also of belief in the resurrection and again going beyond intellectual assent. It's transformational belief that alters action that Paul is calling us to. Get in, then get in. If you believe, then get in. If you're hedging your bets, you don't really believe. You hope, you think it's, you're, you're agreeing that there's a possibility, but if you actually believe, it will alter your, your actions. And so Paul is talking about this, that just as salvation was not exclusive to the Jewish people, neither are they excluded from it. And so he's, he's not making the case that, that Israel is now cut off from salvation, but that their method of pursuing God excludes them. In other words, they're excluding their, themselves. And the reason this is so important is because we can say, well, I'm not Jewish, but that's missing the point entirely. Because a lot of Christians are pursuing, a lot of churchgoers are pursuing God in the same way the Jewish people did. They're pursuing God through their righteousness. They're pursuing God through their activity. Now, uh, today we were, uh, Kenton, uh, Pastor Kent and I were just talking about this, that God calls us to keep the standard of perfection before us. Jesus Christ was perfect. He is perfect. He always will be perfect. And that's the standard. He says repeatedly in his letters, aim for perfection. I pray for your perfection. Jesus said, be ye perfect. And yet Paul later says, not that I am already perfect. He says that that will happen on the day that I stand face to face with Jesus. So there's this tension that we need to live with. And that is that I keep the standard of Jesus before me. Why do I do that? Because in any area where there is any kind of, of ambiguity about our behavior, the perfect standard comes into play. How many times, well, it's just a little white lie. We know that's wrong. How many times we, we see something where, well, you know, I, I remember my brother, uh, you know, checking out some, some woman and, and saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter where you get your appetite. Well, we know that's wrong. Jesus never looked upon a woman with dishonor. So when we keep the standard of Jesus before us, it keeps us, it prevents us from making excuses for our behavior. It doesn't mean that we should live our life in some kind of psychotic pursuit that every day I'm going to... And, and there's been religions that have tried that. You know, that if you sin, you're not really saved. If you, if you mess up at all, you're not really saved. But what does Scripture say? If we say we have not sinned, we make him be out to be a liar. Because we are still living in a broken world. We are still, as we just studied a couple weeks ago, battling the flesh. We are still sometimes weak and we still fail and we need each other. So much of scripture. I remember somebody asking me once and he said, you know, you need to talk more about who God is and what God does and less about man. And I said, the problem is, and I would, I'd love to do that, except that most of the New Testament talks about our behavior. Go through, other than the Gospels, go through the, the book of Acts and go into Romans and Hebrews and the letters of Paul. It really speaks about our behavior. It's calling attention to the difference between how we live and who God is. And the idea that we are called through discipleship to become more like Jesus Christ. Now there's a lot of people that want church to be one way. They want church to basically just be all worship, for example. I've seen churches that are like that. Uh, back in, oh, probably 25 years ago, you had the Toronto Blessing. Anybody knows it, right? And there were people, they would say, you know, we spend so much time laughing, the preacher couldn't even preach the word. Okay? <laughs> the central point of our gathering, the, the, the reason that we get together, I, I had somebody trying to argue with me uh, some years ago. He said, you know, if you look back at the early church, the central focus of their gathering was the, was the Eucharist or was uh, the, the Lord's Supper. The problem with that statement is trying to define the first century church is like trying to find a black cat in a dark room when you're blind and the cat doesn't exist <laughs> the early church met in homes they met in lecture halls 
We can see from the letters that they were vastly different in, in the terms of their maturity, in the terms of their pursuit, in the way they, they behaved. We, saw, we see some that were, were really studious, and they got together, and all they wanted to do was study, right? We, you know, like the Bereans, right? They were, they were the students, and they were very, very into looking over the scriptures. And then you had the Corinthians, which was what, you know, probably very akin to the Pentecostals of today, where they just wanted to get together, and Paul says, y'all get together together everybody has you know somebody wants to do this song and somebody has this word and, he, and so he had to give them instructions here's how you speak in tongues and this is what you do when there's prophecy so there were very very different churches that were operating in the first century but what what I see throughout scripture is this call throughout the epistles of Paul especially and of Peter and of James and of John this call to, to really be placing the word of God as the supremacy over our lives, to knowing God through his word. To, you know, Paul would write a letter and he would, he would say, hey, pass this around to the churches. And even in his lifetime, think about how, how shocking this is. Even in Paul's lifetime, Peter, who butted heads with Paul, they, they didn't always get along. Paul actually had to rebuke Peter at one point. Um, and, and they kind of saw each other, you know, di- but even Peter says that Paul's writings are scripture. Exactly. They're scripture. In the lifetime of Paul, they acknowledge that these, these writings that are going forth are scripture and the church needs to know them. Uh, in the early uh, history of the Pentecostal movement, the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, it became, there became this, this movement of, of kind of pursuit of experience. And, you know, they went from the holy fire to the holy dynamite to the holy lidite. It, it was like one to, you had to have this next experience. And it burned itself out almost within 20 years. And guess what they had to do? They had to come in and, and centralize the word of God. It wasn't that the experiences were evil. And Paul said, I had a, a young man who was sitting across from me once, and he went to, uh, we went to uh, see a, a pastor, and this pastor was pastoring in the Philippines. I think his church was like 100,000 people. So we went to this uh, Assemblies of God Church of God Church, and he, this, this guy's preaching there. And this young man, we were having dinner after, he goes, well, I know that's fake. I said, how do you know that's fake? He said, well, there wasn't any interpretation. Pump the brakes right there. Paul never suggests that it was fake. Paul never once said to the Corinthians, this is fake and it's not from God. He said, even though it is from God, if it was fake, he would say, knock it off. This is of your flesh or this is of the devil. Don't do it. He said, operate it properly. If God has given this gift, he said, the spirit of prophets is subject to the control of prophets. So if God has given this spiritual gift of prophecy and if God has given this spiritual gift of tongues, there's a way that God expects for it to operate. Well, how do we know that? By the word of God. By the word of God. We place the word of God over us and we say this is... So when we gather together to study the word of God, we're called to really absorb it and we're called to apply it. That's why the Bible says do not be just hearers of the word, but be doers of of the word. And it's interesting because as you go through these epistles, you see some instruction about spiritual gifts, but you see a lot of instruction about applying the word. <laughs> because, because I can have, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, if I have the tongues of men and of angels, I, give, I have prophecy, can discern all mysteries, even if I give my body to the flames, if I have not love, I have nothing. I have nothing. So it's the word of God, the centralized word of God. Jesus Christ in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when we're talking about all of who Jesus is, it's not that we look at the Bible and say Jesus and the Bible are interchangeable, but we recognize that we, through relationship, through the access that we have, and sometimes we fail to activate that, You have to understand that's, and the devil doesn't want you to know this, the power of prayer, the power of getting into the word is not in your brain. It's the fact that you now have access behind the veil. Jesus tore the veil. So now when I get into the word, now when I pray, now when I fast, now when I worship, that can be empowered by the spirit of God. 
to bring transformation in my life. And so Paul is talking about that difference between just the intellectual understanding that the law gave us that we were broken creatures and the covenant that we are under now. Um, Four times in three verses, the words all, everyone, and anyone are used without qualification at the end of of the passage that, that we just read. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of All and richly blesses all who call on him for everyone. So we see this. So let's let's go ahead and move on real quick into verse 14. Uh, Paul says, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? That's a that's a good question. How if it's if it's essential that we call upon the Lord, how can we call on the one we have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? Well, there's another great question. What he's talking about is our responsibility here. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words... To the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And and Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. All right, so what he's talking about is the church's responsibility. In this light of a universal salvation, and I don't mean that everybody's saved, I mean the salvation is universally offered to all. doesn't matter who you are, the gospel is for you. Paul says first they must be sent. We are going in response to God's love, but also in response to his direction. It's not just the love of God, because what can happen is how many times we, we think we're doing something loving, Maybe, you, you know, if you've ever dealt with an addict, well, you know, I'll just give him a few bucks. Um, I had a guy tell me once I was doing homeless ministry in, in inner city Miami, and he said, do not give me money. I will spend it on drugs. Appreciated that honesty. Really appreciated that honesty. Most people wouldn't be that honest. Um, so you might think you're doing something helpful, and actually you're doing something destructive. God will never lead you, however, to do something that's unloving. God is, it, it may not make sense to you, But if God is love, then everything he directs us to do, because it flows from a personal relationship. It's not just, I'm guessing, like this woman is saying, hey, as long as I act in love and compassion, mm, the problem is it's your brain guiding your activities and what you think is loving and what you think is compassionate. Uh, We, you know, people are talking a lot about the transgender debate. Well, I switched it a little bit. I said, let me ask you a question. What if it was an 80-pound young lady that came up to you and said, I'm fat, and I need to lose weight? Do you affirm that? Do you, do you tell them that because, hey, you know what? They're not harming anybody, right? It's, it's their life. They're not harming anyone. Of course, that would be a terribly unkind thing. It would be a cruel thing to do, to say, you're right, you're fat. You need to drop another 15. It would be a terrible thing to do. Just agreeing with them. They they may be functional in every other way, but in that area, they're mentally ill. And if you were to say, hey, this is is fine. This is your life. You know, you be you. You're not hurting anybody. It'd be a terribly unkind thing to say. This is why it's so critical in this day and age. Let me tell you, I know as a pastor, we already see this and the word warns us it's going to happen. That we are going to see people in the church with a lesser love for the word of God. They're going to have a lesser love for worship, right? So, you know, sometimes, pardon me if I'm not always, you know, sweet and kind and cuddly, but I'm scared for the church. I'm scared when I see people that are operating with that mentality. That, you know what, it's just, you know, just go ahead and be a nice person and don't do anybody any wrong and you live and let them live. That's called narcissism by proxy. Instead of you exalting yourself, I affirm you so that you affirm me. It's narcissism by proxy. I'm just going to approve everything you do, because who am I to judge? You know, judge not, 
After all, that's the only scripture verse I ever learned, right? Judge not. And that way, it, I don't judge you, and then you don't judge me. And we're all basically building this huge narcissistic society in the church. The word of God comes in like a double-edged sword, the Bible says. Just cuts through all that nonsense. Penetrates to the division of joints and marrow, soul and spirit, and says this is God's standard. And as the church gets closer to the, to the time of the coming of Jesus Christ there's going to be a great falling away. And I tell, you know, when I saw during COVID, people would say, you know, what, what, you know, what does it matter? I kind of like, you know, online church. And I get their shut-ins and things like that. And I get, you know, I can't always be in church. Some, you know, I'll be traveling or whatever, and I'll tune in to, to catch a service. But I said, if you get used to the watching church online, you may end up watching the rapture online. <laughs> because, and, and I had somebody get so mad at me for saying that. And I'm like, I I know you don't like it. Tell me where I'm wrong. Because do you think it's Jesus that wants you disconnected from the body? Or do you think it's Satan who wants you disconnected from the body? Do you think it's Jesus who says, you pick and choose today which teaching you like. And instead of, I mean, I don't know how many times I've gotten done preaching and somebody comes up, man, how did you know? I didn't. You must have had a a listening device in my living room. Yes, because you, that's, you know... I, I, I targeted you right away as great sermon material. You know, so, so I had somebody break it. The Holy Spirit knows. And think back to when you were newly saved, right? I mean, I remember some, some young guy, I was teaching on something, had nothing to do with, he came up and he's like, Pastor, you know, I'm going through this, this, and that, and nothing to do with what I, you know, I, I talk, was talking about. He's like, man, that was just all for me. Okay, right? Because the Spirit of God was just moving in him. And he would see something and, and the Spirit of God would speak to him. And, and most of us have had those experiences where we've been in church and the Spirit of God just hits us. And it, doesn't even, it may not even be anything to do with what the preacher's preaching on. But there's just something about the koinonia, the body of Christ gathering together, inviting Jesus to be a part of our assembly and saying, Lord, have your way. Our worship will always be imperfect, especially when I'm singing. And, 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 and our, our prayers, will, they'll always be imperfect. And we just read that in earlier chapter. You know, sometimes there's just not words and the Spirit has to intercede. And just sometimes it's groans and sighs and we don't even know what we're praying for. But there is something powerful about humbling ourselves, like Hebrews says, about not neglecting, not forsaking the gathering of the body and saying, you know what, Lord? I need to humble myself and just worship you and just trust that it's, I'm not coming just to get something out of it. I'm coming, Lord, in, in, in honor and in reverence to your word because you've told me to. See, that's, that's relationship. That's relationship. I don't always feel like... It's, I used to take Mondays off when I was pastor in, in the Northeast. And so Tuesday was our busy day. And Tuesday also happened to be date night, still is. And there were times I would get home and I'd just be exhausted I'd just be so tired. But I did that, why? Because I wanted to strengthen my relationship. I placed my relationship above my immediate feelings. What's gonna happen in the end times as we get closer and closer is Satan is picking off more and more people. And fewer and fewer people, are, they, they don't know how to worship. They don't spend any time in prayer. They don't spend any time studying the word of God. And that's a scary thing for me as a pastor. Because you cannot pastor people any like that. If you try to just pastor people for the glory, (laughs) you will burn out quick, my friend. And you can ask my wife. I don't get anything out of preaching on Sunday in terms of like an ego placement. I come home, Jennifer can tell you, exhausted. I'm, I'm I'm an introvert. I find it very draining. The bigger the crowd, the more draining it is. I get a lot more sometimes out of small groups, personally than I do from preaching. But when Jesus Christ called me, he also gave me a passion for souls. And I love seeing people become more like Jesus. I had a young man, just a teenager, come up to me after church Sunday and was asking me these questions about repentance. And you could just tell God was working on his heart, right? And you just, that just, you know, Nick, my my son-in-law, 
I was just telling this story. He's not here, so I can tell this. He was a 17-year-old kid, came into the church, started dating my daughter, daughter Bonnie. Bonnie had broken up with her last boyfriend because he wanted to kiss her, and she was saving her first kiss for her wedding day. I didn't, I didn't insist on that. That, was, that came from her. She saw somebody in the church that, that said that, and so she said, I'm going to do the same. So Nick uh, had, as a 17-year-old boy will do, <laughs> uh, 18 maybe at the time, uh, s- said, uh, and he newly saved kid, um, sent her some kind of inappropriate text and I found out about it well he manned up and apologized but I pulled him aside in the foyer of the church and we had a, we had a talk we had a talk <laughs> I know I'm about 5'6 but believe me I can be a little bit intimidating I don't know if you put, <laughs> but, uh, but we had a little talk about 2-3 weeks later Bonnie was riding home I think from church uh, with me and she says to me dad what did you say to Nick and I said what and she said well we got back we were having dinner at Chili's and we we're going to his house. His mom was there. And we were just talking. And so he shut the car off and we were talking. And he, he stopped and he said, we need to get inside. I don't want anybody thinking you're sitting in a parked car with a, with a young man. Ding, ding, ding. He gets it. It's not just about protecting from burglars and robbers. Protecting her reputation. Right? It's about, and it's about our role. And that's relationship. If our relationship with God is take, 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 take. Right? I just want to be fed. I just want more knowledge. I just want more experiences. That's not a relationship. Relationship is asking, what is my role here? Why am I here? Right? So I better know as a dad what my relationship is. It's different with my children than with my spouse or with my mother or with my father. Right? So I need to understand what my role in the relationship is. And what Paul is talking about is that we are sent. Our role in this relationship is to tell others. God, God would love to have you at his feet right now in, in heaven. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Why are you still here? That's a great question to ask. So it's imperative to recognize God actively directs the ministry of the gospel. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, listen to this, until we all reach unity in the faith. Are we there yet? We all 100% unified. Nobody ever grouses. Nobody ever complains. Nobody's ever upset. I've never pastored such a church. If we get there, I will celebrate. I will, we will have a party with a big old cake. We're not there yet. And the knowledge of the Son of God to become mature, and that word mature is ripe. It means that we are functioning just like the difference between an apple this big that's green and an apple this big that's red. They're both apples. No doubt about it. But until we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. But don't miss that first part. It was he who gave. In other words, God is actively ordaining. He's actively calling individuals in the body of Christ, as he did with me, to instruct, to encourage, to exhort, to lead to bring the body to maturity so that we go out and do what God has called us to do. Preach, in other words, communicate the gospel. doesn't mean you have to come up here. It means that you are called to communicate the gospel. We must receive it personally. There's some who've never had a chance to believe the gospel because they insulate themselves from the hearing of it. They they just like this person. I I, Well, you know, I want to be a good person. I want to do good things, but I don't want Jesus. I've talked about my friend, very intelligent guy. He's a scientist at MIT. And he would come to church every Sunday and he would sing the songs and he would say the prayers up to, Lord, I give you my life. Because that was the step. That was the hard thing. I, I, I surrender my life to you. That's where it got difficult. <clears throat> we have a responsibility to believe the gospel and not just intellectually believe it, by the way, um, because... We call upon the one we believe. We believe the gospel, but we also call upon the one we believe in. In other words, if, if there's no God, who are we talking to? <laughs> if, there's no, if there's no God, you're just talking to air. I had a brother, and he's passed away. He was an atheist, and he would talk to himself in the shower. I'm like, who are you talking to? Right? If I'm talking to myself in the shower, I'm probably praying. If, I'm, if you hear me, if you go to my house and you hear me walking around my bedroom, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking to myself. I'm not, I'm not schizophrenic, right? I'm not asking myself, well, what do you think, Dave? I don't know, you know. It's quiet, both of you, right? I, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm actually, so we call upon the one in whom we believe in. 
Where Israel went wrong, and this is, we're going to close up with this. Where Israel went wrong, they heard. In other words, the failure was not on the part of God. It was communicated. Um, it wasn't that, 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 that there was the will of God for them not to be saved. That wasn't true at all. Uh, we talked about this idea of the elect last week. If they were simply not the elect, it would be a simple theological point. It would just, hey, this is established history. They were not the elect, and so God didn't want them saved. But as Paul just said, it's for all. It's for everyone. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If, if, if we try to shove in the doctrine of the elect, it gets difficult. If you believe that only the people that God has... Pre- D. James Kennedy, by the way, he was a Calvinist. He was a five-point Calvinist. He had a huge megachurch in South Florida. Some of you remember, you might have listened to his radio programs or whatnot. Um, he developed an evangelism explosion. And he tells a funny story about how he was knocking on doors, training people how to use this program that we still use in churches today. And he said a guy you know, came, and it was this torn up old T-shirt with stains on it, and was, the guy was rude, and D. James Kennedy had this very resonant, bold, deep voice. And I decided at that moment that he was clearly not of the elect. So imagine my surprise when several weeks later, this man, who was not part of God's elect, was freely worshiping the Lord in my church. <laughs> right? So somebody else had reached him and witnessed to him, invited him to church, and the man got saved. And so the problem is, what happens if you're not the elect and you're not ordained to be saved, but you accidentally say the prayer and you accidentally call upon the Lord and you accidentally believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead? There's a problem here. It, theologically, doctrinally. So Paul is, not, Paul is not making that argument. It would be incongruent with all the argument that he's made throughout Romans. They understood. So you can't make this idea that, well, they, just, they didn't realize uh, because Paul's making the argument. The Gentiles who didn't have the law came to salvation. They didn't understand the connection. They didn't understand all the analogies, and they still came to salvation. Where they went wrong was they rejected. And that is when we stand before the Lord, When we stand before the Lord, that is going to be the crux of the issue. What did you do with the man called Jesus Christ? That was the question Pontius Pilate asked. What do I do with this man called Jesus? Do I I embrace his teaching? Do I follow him? Because if if he is the one who has entered into our world, entered into our universe, and telling us about this new heavens and a new earth that's coming, and he's the one who ascended back where he came from, why do you think he said over and over and over, follow me? He he very rarely said, believe in me. Almost every time he would call someone, he would look at them and say, follow me. And they had a choice at that point. Some followed him, but some said, Lord, I'm busy. Lord, I've got these other things to do. Lord, what's going to happen to me? And they rejected. And that's what we have to make up our mind every time. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross daily. Because one of the great things about church, and I'll close with this, one of the great things about church is it presents us with an opportunity every time we gather together to train ourselves to die to ourselves. Because we're sitting under the word of God. And especially, maybe you're sitting in church on Sunday And you're worshiping the Lord and God hits you with a verse. What do you do at that point? See, it trains you kind of, you know, we're all surrounded by people who are like-minded. And and we're worshiping God and we've set an atmosphere. It trains us how to mortify the flesh and say, God, I'm going to say yes to you. God may say, I want you to give to this missionary. Or God may say, I want you to come down to this altar. Or God may say, I had somebody, you know, before cell phones come to me and say, hey, can I borrow the church phone? I need to call somebody and ask forgiveness. Because Jesus said, don't, don't lay your gift at the altar until you've, until you've made things right with your brother. So when the word of God speaks, how do I respond? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for, the, for the, just the blessing of, of the teachings of your word. And Father God, Lord, as, as we think of the prayer requests around us, we think of the, the need around us, we think of the strategy of the enemy. Father God, what you long for is an equipped church. Lord God Almighty, not, a, not an inward-looking church, not a church just looking to kind of ride out the tough storm until the rapture comes, but a church that is looking at the, the mission, the call, and the responsibility that you've given us 
And Father, saying, just like Isaiah did, here I am, send me. Father God, we will have vastly different calls. You will speak very, very different to each of us. And even under the same word, you may speak a dozen different instructions to your people or more. But Father God, train us to be responsible. Israel went wrong because they heard, they understood, and they rejected. Help us to hear, help us to understand, and help us to follow and embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.